time for our uh, leadership panel on developing your career and, and fostering diversity. I'd like to ask uh, Claire, can you, um, can you share your, your screen now? So um, uh, the panel is going to be moderated by Claire Barrett, who is the leader of our Women and APIs initiative. I will say that it's, it's not just for, for women because there, firstly, there is a role for, for men to play in helping uh, uh, foster the careers of, of women in technology and, and in APIs. But also, uh, and I learned this just from the discussions we had uh, preparing for this panel, there are also a lot of things that, that men can use in developing your own career, uh, speaking at conferences, uh, raising your profile through writing, finding a mentor. Uh, these are all very relevant things uh, for men as, as well as women. So um, please uh, welcome Claire. Thank you, John. Delighted to to join you this uh, this morning in Singapore. I'm actually in the UK, so uh, a little bit earlier. Um, uh, I'm, but uh, my name is Claire Barrett, and I make strategy happen. And I'm delighted to have uh, a, a fabulous panel of uh, uh, colleagues, women, um, friends, now this morning to join us in a conversation for the next 45 minutes or so on what it takes to bring diversity to life. And, and to your point, this is this is a conversation for everyone and uh, delighted to have Mitra, Uma and Su Chu join me. So if you can each um, share your screens so that we can say hi to everybody. Hi everyone. Good morning, Mitra. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Claire. Hi. So um, <laughs> we couldn't have a better qualified group here this morning. And uh, um, I'm uh, delighted to introduce Mitra Her Her Visit Day. She's an inspiring people oriented chief architect uh, for technology in the uh, finance sector. Um, everyone wave. Um, so choose so. Uh, is a digital transformation leader who's passionate about driving women's representation in technology. And Uma Balasingam joins us as a motivated, results-oriented, executive champion for diversity. And this is opportunity this morning is to share some of our own, some stories, um, hear from your own experiences and some of the really exciting initiatives that you've led, that you've been involved in, that you're passionate about, that have been making a difference uh, for yourself, your community, and your, your colleagues. Um, uh, today is not a discussion about why we need diversity in the technology world. It's um, the, the research is a given. The um, Sorry, I'm just uh, seeing on the chat whether there's a bit of background noise. Um, there's no, uh, it's not a critical argument that we, we need to do something about diversity. And it's a, it's a massive topic. We could spend this whole conference talking about why the need for diversity is important. Um, but I'd like to um, actually explore your individual experiences. So Uma, for your career has relied on a lot of uh, conviction and uh, passion with helping customers make a difference. How, how do you explain your uh, passion and conviction about the diversity agenda? Yeah. Hey, Claire, great to be here with uh, everyone today. And um, I always think about Scott Page and the book that he writes on the difference and the diversity math. Um, and so it's a really simple concept that if organizations are looking for um, innovation in order to drive um, revenues generated from new products or services or new markets, um, you actually need a random group of intelligent problem solvers, and that will always outperform a group of the best problem solvers. Um, and that really comes down to the ability uh, to harness differences on how people encode problems and attempt to solve them. And diversity of thought actually comes from knowledge and perspectives and heuristic, but it's also influenced by race and geography and gender or age. So there's <clears throat> many studies that, that show this, but if you took a room filled of the 
A players and put them all in the room and they all think the same way. There's very little addition uh, that you can contribute when you're trying to innovate. So that's really how I try and think about it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and uh, Suchu, you shared with us uh, some of your, your own experiences about how you personally have taken uh, diverse, what diversity is meant for you in your life and how, you've, how you bring that to life every day. Would you um, share with, with us a little bit more about uh, how you got into this, what it means for you? Sure, I think diverse, can you guys hear me? Um, we'll just need to, you need to be a little bit louder. We, um... uh, okay, is that better? Have you got um, headphones in? Sometimes that's uh, yeah. It's... Um, it, sometimes it's better if you take the headphones out. No, we're um, you're on mute. Sorry, we should have done a test on that. Um, do you want to just we'll just take a little little pause? Do you have a microphone on your um uh, on your PC and perhaps take your headphones? It's possible to take your headphones out. That's okay. No, we still um we still can't hear you. Um, I might um uh, I might just just invite you to uh to have a share of some of your your own background. You also talked with us separately about how diversity has or inclusion and, and dealing with change has been so fundamental in your in your life and your background. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks for inviting me to this panel conversation. Um, um, yeah, I'm happy to share. I think it makes sense if I just uh, provide you a bit of a background uh, on myself. I, I was born in Iran and, and spent the first 25 years of my life there technically enduring the Islamic revolution and, and uh, Iran and Iraq war and could say the challenging time to be a young woman in Iran. So, sorry, I'm hearing a bit of a background noise. Um, I migrated to Australia in mid twenties and very quickly realized that I was in minority over there as well. Being a female, English not being my first language and also have a profession in IT, which is a very main male dominated in industry. I think that says it all. Um, and by, by heart, I knew that my only chance to survive and thrive was to adapt. But I find it the toughest challenge to adapt was that whilst I'm doing it, however, I had to stay true to myself, stay authentic and resist to give in to the norm, uh, into a typical stereotype role models that created by having mainly masculine attributes in mind, unfortunately. I think in my opinion, it's very easy to deny or overlook that we have a problem when it comes to diversity. It's sometimes easy to overlook subtle privilege which in different environments, for example, baby boomers, our generation Y, extroverts versus introverts, English speaking language versus non -speak, uh, English speaking language. I, I call it privilege, but, but I, other people call it something else, but it's all about recognizing and acknowledging it. I think in my view, it's all about embracing and acknowledging the value of these differences, as I mentioned, especially under current circumstances that we're all facing across the globe, you know, COVID-19, the change that is out of our control, uncertainty, etc. I think it takes conscious effort to constantly be cognizant of this and create a safe 
an inclusive environment. And I think, Omar, I loved your reference to innovation. It's, it's a great reference. You can't be innovative if you don't have the, the diversity of thinking and different point of views on the table. But yeah. No, thank you, Mitra. And Suchu, uh, do you want to just try if we can hear you okay again now? Okay, can, can you guys hear me? It is very quiet, so um, perhaps if you can just... Uh... No, that's... <laughs> um, it, that, did, that did affect it, but it went down. Maybe just while you were um, uh, looking on that again, Uma, I might um, uh, uh, ask you a little bit about um, how, uh, uh, um, what's in terms of sort of conversations and stories, what sorts of initiatives you've got involved in that have um, uh, at your workplace and in your environment that are actually making making a difference. I know you're extremely active in your in the uh, Singapore community. <laughs> yeah. Um... So I, I'm, I'm very passionate about an equal world and where I've chosen to focus my passion on is gender. And about four years ago, uh, myself and a complete stranger, Helen Dukes, uh, two non-Singaporeans who was very inspired by the book by Sheryl Sandberg, written 2013, Lean In, um, decided, you know, what would happen if we both stood up and told our stories? And, you know, the book inspired us because you know, after many years of making progress, whether it was the right to vote or to, the right to drive or read or progress in the workplace, suddenly everything came to a halt, especially um, in the workplace. And Cheryl was curious about what uh, happened there. So the book talks about two elements, which is around the glass ceiling or, or as we call it, the bamboo ceiling here in Asia and, and factors that are imposing um, or preventing women from progressing, and also the sticky flaws, so what women do to hold themselves back. Um, and so we started a movement uh, here in Singapore. We're four years old now. And um, I spun off a women in tech uh, for Lean In for both Singapore and Asia, uh, simply because, you know, it's a male-dominated industry. I'm a woman in tech myself. I started uh, as an engineer, I, I now lead a sales organization of over 500 people in 48 markets, and I feel responsible uh, to make it easier for the women who stand next to me and who are coming up behind me. And, um, you know, with Singapore now pouring more investments into Smart Nation and so many other initiatives, they need innovation, they need diversity, and it's important that the women in Singapore can uh, participate in that. And, of course, economic participation, as we've all seen, uh, contributes greatly to GDP. Um, and I think what I've learned from starting a movement is that one person can affect change um, because it's simply because of one other person hearing your story. And, and this is really generally how we started. You know, we stood up and told our stories and then another woman joined us and another woman, another woman. And then, you know, a man showed up um, and now we're 4,000 people. Um, and I that's the power of a movement and even more so now with the pandemic we need communities more than ever fantastic and um uh i uh, I, i'm particularly curious about whether you see that in singapore there uh, you know that some of this diversity story um plays out differently for people than perhaps um uh what you've seen or experienced in uh in other areas countries cultures yeah, I think Singapore is unique in a, in a few ways. You know, when we talk about um, recognizing uh, equal work and having men be equal partners at home, I guess we're a little bit more advantaged in the fact that we have foreign domestic workers who can assist us. But then Singapore uh, also has multi-generational homes where, you know, not only are you taking care of your children, you're taking care of your own parents and your in-laws, uh, for example. And, you know, this work from home right now is um, somewhat, I think, on, on, the, on the great side of it, um, I think people are recognizing you can actually do your work from anywhere and you don't need to show up physically. Uh, whereas, you know, when women started um, using flexible working hours where corporates uh, had this benefit, they were often penalized for using that. So I think that's one positive that's coming out of the pandemic, but also I think equally 
you know, with schooling uh, children at home and all of that, it has placed additional burdens uh, onto women uh, right now. So I, I think there's um, some uniqueness in, in Singapore from that aspect. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, did you did, did, we'll just see if we can, um, if you can uh, join us. Do you want to just test if we can hear you okay? No, we're still... Uh, we're still seeing you in mute, I'm afraid. Um, uh, you could um, <laughs> could contribute to some online uh, chat discussion. Um, yeah. No, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, sadly, we can't hear you. Um, Mitra, uh, we were just talking there with Umar about uh, the the some of the cultural differences. You've recently arrived in Singapore. Um, but you've lived in many countries. How how are you finding um, uh, you know this this experience and what and how that's playing out for for you in the diversity that you see at work, albeit from home, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, joining a new team? What that's been feeling like for you? And you've done it before. How how do you uh, how do you bring that uh, inclusivity into your uh, joining a new experience? Um, and we might ask you just to speak quite. I'm bit. very lucky to have uh, get a lot like that. I, I, I feel quite lucky that at this stage of my career, I had the opportunity to come and, and, and live in Singapore and join the Standard Chartered Bank, uh, which has got a large food, footprint around the globe. And, and also, I'm, I'm kind of a, playing a role in the retail and private bank and wealth, which, which has technically a footprint across 40 plus countries. And I'm in charge of uh, tech strategy, architecture, and a few other central fixings. I don't want to bore everyone with it, but uh, playing quite, quite a strategic role. And I find it quite interesting. It's a learning from a, um, a diversity perspective. It, even it's, it makes it um, more multidimensional because I see the differences between the cultures from one country than other country. Um, I think I, I mentioned that because I've always been on a minority side, I'm quite cognizant of creating an inclusive and safe environment for my team, but I find that it's much more even challenging. And especially with the role I create, we have to support our business colleagues with the digital innovation agenda. I need to be even further cognizant of it, as you mentioned, to have the diversity of thinking um, and, and point of view included in my team. Mm -hmm. These are all the dimensions that I have to constantly be, uh, be across. And also, I think in my view, whilst gender is a big strong focus, well, but also other aspects are quite imp important. I realized uh, different cultures, they, the way they, they think, the way they look at the problem, the way they respect each other, more active listeners than others. They, that all creates a healthier dimension, I think, within the team when we are in a creative mood to, to come up with an agenda. What I have been doing, because it's been eight, nine months, uh, haven't been sitting there uh, kind of idle, also bringing a vast you know, experience in there. So I've always been a champion in diversity back in Australia into here as well. I've been active, actively mentoring and coaching uh, my team members, extended team across different countries and also wider community. Also sponsoring uh, some young talents I strongly believe to into to, to, and help them to thrive because I know in some part of my career, I couldn't have done it without having those strong sponsors on my side helping me out. Also, another thing that has been very interesting journey for me, hosting this weekly talent and the diversity brown bag with an intimate group of 10 and 15, a colleague of mine and myself, a male and female kind of a week, we're running it with a very intimate group and, and creating a kind of a safe environment for an open dialogue on a weekly basis. We dedicate one hour of our time. It's been amazing, the feedback from the team getting involved. And also, back to your first question, for me, I've I, I realized that the opportunities and challenges from Africa to Malaysia to India is totally different. You know, when, I, when you talk to different uh, female, young female talent, you know, working in different countries, it's been quite an amazing journey. And, and I've uh, persevering in building a healthy pipeline here internally and externally from a right talent pool and also ensuring 
that uh, we have a more inclusive um, interviewers in as part of the interview panel and and also uh, more inclusive job descriptions and and interview questions as well these are the early thinking that i have been personally bringing into my new team i'm interested about you know, um again practical hints for the for the for the audience listening to us you know, what does a more diverse job description or a more inclusive job description look like what is what are some of the yeah. things that um, people are, and Uma, please, you know, join us with. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your perspectives. Yes, I, I think the job description I started that I did a bit of a surgery on is start with using a lot of technical jargons, and in some cases, not most of them were relevant to the job in hand. And um, and we know we are all I'm technologists by heart, and I still stay on top of technology, but it's constantly changing. I used to be an engineer many years ago, yeah. But the languages keep changing, the libraries keep changing. But as, as a being a senior architect, I don't necessarily have to remember all. But just by putting those very technical jargon, you can easily, do you know what I mean, exclude some of the talents being out there. Or uh, providing or little hints that the job requires a full time or not flexible. We put we have the flexible environment there, but in the description, somehow hidden hints. Do you know what I mean? Can uh, a kind of a um, what do you call it stop some candidates? And we know that usually female candidates they have to fit 150% of the job criteria described in the position. Uh, yeah, these are the subtle changes, and also working with other vendors that helping us to source the talent to 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 have a broader do you know what I mean perspective, and and have a more balanced. Approach. What, what are some of the things Uma, that uh, you and your um, team work with on, uh, uh, you know, building that, uh, building a diverse team, uh, recruiting in, keeping, maintaining? Yeah, uh, a few things just to add on what Mitra is saying there about job descriptions. Um, you know, it's it's one of the things I think as leaders and managers, we need to be more cognizant of. And the great news is, you know, let's leverage the power of technologies. Um, there's so many platforms today, like um, Textio, for example, that will look through a job description and advise you on terms, et cetera, that will get you a less diverse pool of candidates to apply. But I think where, um, given I'm in sales, you know, I, I tend to look out for male advantaging terms, like seeking someone that is ambitious and um, aggressive, you know, in sales, you know, those are male advantaging terms. Um, and we want to try and think about the criteria. I think a lot of times organizations do a copy and paste on job descriptions and they don't really have dialogues about what exactly is the criteria that you're going to be looking for. Are you going to prefer, for example, education over experience? Um, because what happens is then, you know, as you go through the process and you say, well, we want someone with 20 years. Okay, well, why not 18 years? Um, or if you would want experience over education and then you find a candidate that has more education over experience, but, you know, cognitive dissonance sets in, that candidate happens to be someone that looks like a person that would be successful in the role, you switch your criteria. Um, and then you go towards um, that, and, and it happens so often. I mean, unfortunately, we can't put up blind curtains like they did with the orchestra in the 70s for people to audition for jobs because that helped increase and remove bias. So I think being aware and being more conscious about um, having, like Matra said, a diverse group of panelists in the interview panel. And what I found really super useful uh, in my previous company is having the panel explain why did you choose candidate B over candidate A? Because when you actually get somebody to articulate why did they have a preference of, uh, of B over A, you only have it through and you can't say things like, true story, I selected him because I felt I could go have a drink at a bar with him. He looks like someone I can socialize with because that wasn't the criteria of the job, was it? Um, so I, I find that to be useful as well. Yeah, no, thank you, Uma. It's great to uh, to hear about those sorts of experiences. Um, they make it much more real, I think, um, for for people. 
Um, uh, you've um, been very active in this uh, in the Lean In um, community. Uh, how have you taken some of the things that you've done there, brought them back into the workplace, and vice versa? How, what is it? What has it meant for for you? What does it look like um, uh, in terms of uh, having that the four thousand people that you have uh, uh, yeah. managed to to influence? Yeah, I, I, I've had a few uh, great lessons in the last four years of, um, you know, founding this movement in Singapore. I, I think first and foremost, is recognizing that everybody starts from a different point, a, a different starting point. And I think respect and kindness is critical when you're trying to encourage people to have conversations that are um, and <clears throat> it's very easy for us to judge. Um, so I think benefit of doubt is important. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's men that's listening uh, <clears throat> into this panel. And what I found is like nine out of 10 times, they actually don't know what they don't know. And so as people are trying to learn and navigate um, underrepresented groups, and I, I think empathy is required on both sides, you know, the ones with privilege and the ones that are underrepresented. Because I think it's easy for you know, I could say, okay, well, I'm dark skin and I'm Asian and I'm a woman, three crosses against me. Um, and if someone were to go ask me, oh, where are you from? You know, I shouldn't get upset about that and go like, what do you mean? Like, I am from, um, then that's just gonna turn that person away. And I just say, hey, I'm from Singapore. I grew up in Malaysia, but I'm fourth generation Sri Lankan. Because people are genuinely curious. Uh, so when we talk about inclusion, I think empathy on both sides um, is critical. And I don't think we talk enough about underrepresented groups um, being uh, showing empathy. Uh, what I find in my work specific to gender is that fathers of daughters um, are always the first to um, lean in. Um, they're very concerned about what the future workplace uh, looks for their daughters. Um, and having men as allies, um, you know, similar to me, I wouldn't have gotten here without mentors and sponsors. Um, and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, they were all men um, that got me here. Um, and there's, there's many other things which I'm sure, Claire, you're going to ask me later on, on some of the tangible actions that we can all take. Uh, absolutely. Mitra, have you, um, uh, you want to contribute anything in? The... Yes, I, I think I thought about uh, very, very similar. Um, it's. I, I think it's very hard. It, it's. It's. I, I find it for some of us is easier than the rest to be inclusive leaders. I think my message to people that who are listening, I think um, as Omar mentioned, if you are on a minority side, it's always top of your mind because you felt it. But if you happen to not be on that side, it requires a bit of effort. And, and my advice to everyone, and, and also for me, even being a minority, it's all about self-awareness as well. I think the first step would be that you be aware of your, your own bias, conscious and unconscious, the generalization you make, and step by step, when you become aware of it, you can change it, okay? And that's how, uh, like Uma mentioned, the social movement starts from yourself. I think that's where you become a first leader and then radiate it to the others. Uh, I, I think that's 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 my um, I, if I could leave everyone with an advice. And also, I think it's very easy little things that um, you can make free for people not being included. It makes the job harder for leaders. Little refer references like we make sometimes. You know, I used to work in Australia. And, and people are crazy about a sport. You can't start a meeting with a comment about a sport. And I don't like a sport. For 10, first 10 minutes of meetings, I always feel like, what, what am I doing here? Or, as you mentioned, meeting hasn't finished. They talk about going to this bar, have that beer or that. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's in Australia. But here, it could be different. Little references when they want to use the analogy to a TV program or a childhood TV program, probably broadcasted in one country, not another country. Or I mean, these little things that maybe not work related, but in, in a work environment, especially around when you have team around you, when you do, you have to be cognizant. And we're all human, we may refer to it, but we can quickly kind of bring the mm -hmm. others. Do you know about this? Have you heard about this? 
etc make sure they are freely included in the conversation um, and i think I um uh, Richard, yeah, yeah. that's a great point too. There was actually a question from uh, Jess in the uh, online chat um, to you about uh, your survival and thrival, th thriving um, and what are some of the things that you've needed to adapt. And I think those examples of uh, these little small um, uh, things for, the, for our antenna to be very, um, for us to be very tuned to uh, the subtleties in, these, in these, non, uh, these social interactions that go on around our workplace. Uh, probably a great lead in, Uma, to um, the micro moment uh, strategy that you talk about. I might just um, flip to our to our other slide, which um, uh, we've talked about how important it is to uh, to, to take action. Um, uh, there are, as we said, the, the likelihood of the audience in at, the, at this conference to to mainly be made up of people who identify as male um, uh, at a at a tech oriented conference such as this. Um, is, uh, is, a, is a strong statistical likelihood. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'd be really uh, interested to hear from some of the things that uh, people can do uh, for others as men, um, as well as some of the things we've talked about you can do for yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, a big part of the work that we do at Lean in Singapore is focused around unconscious bias. And I think the word bias is important to just spend a minute on because it can come across as a negative word, but it certainly isn't that. And the word unconscious is equally important. Um, it's got nothing to do with your values. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. You can't really cure it. So it's, it's all about being aware uh, of it, right? I mean, I certainly place bias every time a female, you know, Uber grab driver shows up and I get worried I'm gonna be late because my mother was a terrible driver, right? Um, and, and so for the rest of the journey, I'm imposing all kinds of, you know, I'm waiting for the female driver to, you know, not perform as well to validate my bias. Um, so, you know, it's important to recognize we all have bias. And uh, we launched a men's chapter, He for She, uh, here in Singapore. And what they're trying to do um, with all the founders there is really help men to step in on what we call micro moments. And maybe I'll demonstrate. Uh, a quick story of a personal friend who's a female leader and back at the time where we could travel for meetings she was asked to um, attend a very urgent global leadership meeting and she needed to get to Europe quickly and she shows up she walks into the boardroom um, it's pretty much all men in the room and one of her colleagues looks at her and goes I can't believe you made it who's looking after your children at home and you know in that kind of instance she froze and you know, for all the men out there, you know, we, we, we sit here and we're talented, smart, successful women. But when someone throws a comment like that at you, you absolutely freeze and you don't know what to say because she's taking that as, oh, my God, I'm a bad mother. Um, and actually someone who's listening to this story might say, oh, well, he's an a-hole, you know. Um, you know, no, I would never say that. But actually, maybe he was just concerned who was actually taking care of her kids and that's a micro moment where I think someone could have stepped in to say, well, actually, your husband's not traveling, right? Remember, there was another person that made these babies with you um, to take care of the children. Um, and that's a micro moment because we feel that actually not saying something, and again, coming back to kindness and respect, um, do it privately if you want to call it out, but not saying something is actually the bigger crime, um, because as long as everybody keeps laughing at that bad joke, um, everybody feels like they have to agree with the most senior person in the room, then we're not going to make progress on having these uncomfortable conversations. Um, and so that's kind of what we're trying to do uh, at Lean In. In terms of what men can do, you know, uh, plenty. And, and again, I also want to stress, they are half of the equation, not more. There's also a piece about what women need to do to help themselves and what organizations need to do as they think about policies, et cetera. Um, so um, we talked about interviews and um, job descriptions and making sure there's a diverse uh, panel of interviewers and also a diverse team of candidates, right? Race, gender, et cetera. Um, and the other thing um, that is also important, I, I, I believe now, even more so than ever, after the he, uh, the V2 movement, sorry, is that, you know, you should mentor a woman. 
if most corporations um, and managers today are men, there's only so much a woman can do to progress herself. So if you're not mentoring a woman today, you should absolutely do that. I know that men are more hesitant to do that. Well, you know, pre-pandemic, now it's uh, during pandemic, everything's virtual because after Me Too, there's a discomfort on spending one-on-one -on -one time alone with women. So, you know, a, a senior executive man can be having a drink with the junior uh, executive male and that's called mentoring, but if that was a young woman, that's called something else. So have a very simple policy. I will only do lunch and just be equal to everybody, right? Um, but I think men definitely should um, lean into mental women um, and challenge that bias in micro moments. And, and another simple thing that you can do and um, is, is the story of uh, one of the HeForShe co-founders who is a CEO of a multi-billion dollar a tech company, he decided that his chief of staff a few years ago would be this very young 20-something-year-old woman from the Philippines because he wanted to give young talent a chance. And chief of staff for his company means she gets to sit on every single one of these meetings, even the most confidential ones. And so when she shows up at meetings with him, people naturally tend to think that, oh, that's the assistant, she's here to take notes. And he was talking to me about this and they said, just introduce her differently. And this is what, um, and a great example of how you advocate for women, just by simply changing how you introduce them. So he started changing and saying, oh, here's Louise, um, she's my chief of staff. She sits on my leadership team and she's a critical part of um, of our formation of strategy and any decision I make for this company. So immediately, it just takes away the bias. Everybody in the room knows who she is. She's important. They're going to listen to what she says. They're not going to interrupt her. You know, so many other ripple effect of things happen differently just by introducing women differently. So I would say the next time you choose to introduce your female colleague or um, your friends in the workplace, think about how you introduce them differently. Yeah, it's a great example. And I think Uma, many of us um, as women in professional work have also found ourselves um, guilty of that, how to not help yourself by naturally being the person that, you know, sets up the teleconference, that takes the, the notes, that uh, um, lets, you know, and it may be just because it kind of feels like it's helpful or it feels like um, nobody else wants to put their hand up to do it. But there, 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 there are all these little things um, which, until we until we wake up to them, um, we're often uh, really not uh, not aware of. Um, Mitya, I mean, what are your? Uh, yeah, I, I your think it was very well said, Omar. I, I just add a few things. I think based on what you said, and and I think my experience, I can say easily that it takes courage to be an inclusive leader in this environment because as you mentioned it very rightly that we need to kind of uh, help our peers our colleagues our team members to be aware of this you know subtle behaviors that uh, that could exclude others as well um, uh, I, and if you see something that is not right because people either unconscious it's based on unconscious or conscious bias, you can call them. I have a good example of one of my colleagues a few years ago, um, but because you know, we've been the champion of diversity and he being a colleague, a male colleague, we, we talked about it a lot. And after looking at, he was very, a start from self-awareness, he said, oh, when I look at my team, everyone looks like me, talks like me, acts like me and share my values. I've created a team of mini me. That was ex exactly what he said. And he said, what are you going to do about it? So, and, and he said, okay, next time I want to interview, I'm going to face that to exactly look for someone that is not like me. First experience he went through, he went through, it was tough. But after I was very proud of him. It was very hard for him to, to overcome the fear of unfamiliar. That's what it is, the fear yeah. of unfamiliar, but he could master it. I'm very proud of him after two years, then for him, it was easy to have a team member that exactly demonstrates opposite behavior as he does, or, or do you know what I mean? Acts or talks or even look different. That's, I, I, I think um, my, my advice to everyone is be courageous. 
and start the social movement starts from you if you are a male or female. I think um, we all have a duty to play, especially under current circumstances. Yeah, I I, I often um, uh, feel that people need to find their own voice on this diversity issue. Um, matter, um, change, uh, initiative, uh, you know, movement, um, and that it takes a little bit of time to to, to find your voice. Um, I, I, I find it's like um, putting on a new a new coat or a new jacket. It's a bit uncomfortable for a while. It can be a bit scratchy. Um, you know, you maybe need to try it in, try it in a few different different uh, settings, um, and uh, and and reach out and, uh, and and kind of get a bit of a practice. Um, uh, with with other people who who find it easier to speak the language because there's a little bit of a language there's a um, that there's a way to feel confident about talking about this issue because it is uncomfortable for many people and I think um, a lot of our, our, our male colleagues and peers in the environment want to be able to help and want to be able to contribute and want to be able to have the conversation with us um, uh, uh, with everyone and with their teams but then they're, they're not always they're a bit they're a bit nervous perhaps. Um, and so uh, I, I wonder if there's also a, a call to um, to have a conversation. You know, maybe it's a one-on-one. -on -one. How do how do I talk about this? What sorts of things could my colleagues, my team, my my, my friends, my family? You can practice with your friends. Actually, that's a <laughs> a good way of getting to um, uh, uh, getting to, to 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 talk about it. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm curious. Have, have have either of you found that um, uh, in your own families and and friendship circles? That this, uh, you know, diversity topic um, is very real. And how, how does it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess since I started this this work, and uh, I mean, if anybody told me four years ago I would be doing this, I'd, I'd be laughing at you. But um, you know, a lot of friends were curious, and which was great because given there's a foundational relationship, it was more comfortable to ask me questions about, you know, you know, haven't we already come to an equal world? Well, not really. Uh, we're about 217 years away and here's why, you know, just being able to ask questions like that and just sharing real stories of what's going on with me in the workplace. Um, you know, as simple as, you know, the, the stolen idea, right? Because women are more often than not judged on our uh, performance and men on potential. And one of the ways that that manifests in the workplace is with the stolen idea. And I, I don't know if this has happened to you and maybe for all of us, let's let's see uh, in our next meetings, if that happens, you know, I, I've said something in a meeting filled with men and, um, you know, meeting goes on like I didn't say anything. And then my male colleague says exactly the same thing. And someone goes, uh, or the boss goes, great idea, Alistair. Um, and, and actually, when it happened to me, I did um, have a private conversation with my boss. And, you know, to my point earlier, he had no clue that he did that. It, it's just unconscious. Um, and so we made it into this teaching moment. And the next time when we were together as a leadership team, um, I think humor is so important to kind of cut the, uh, you know, um, the tension of, of talking about something really uncomfortable. And we shared this story about how I said something in the meeting, it, you know, it went on and he ignored me and our head of marketing said exactly the same thing. And um, so, so we actually ended up sharing the, the story with everybody else. And it was a very humorous moment because for the rest of that meeting, people started listening up even more and, and, mm -hmm calling out little jokes about, oh, you know, Claire, if you said something, they would in, you know, kind of in sense of humor, get like, oh, Mitra, great idea, just to prove a point. Um, and I think um, that's something that's worked um, really well for me. It's just, you know, you want to keep it light. You want to absolutely encourage people, especially men who are curious, um, and you want to show empathy because they yeah. I have to be out there and they want to do the right thing. And, you know, we all don't have answers, but we can talk about it. And that's the best. Yeah. And sometimes that uh, that positive 
you know, as you say, keeping it a light calling, you know, walking into a room, you know, that is, you know, full of men, for example, and asking, you know, so how are we going to make sure that we have a, um, a really diverse conversation? You know, and, and, and kind of like, okay, um, that, Again, I think you do have to obviously be able to read read the environment. Um, this, I'm just going to, um, uh, I should see if you, if you can see the online chat, but um, uh, Kuldeep has um, uh, asked a, a question about um, uh, uh, to what extent they think um, women should be um, acting within the culture of the environment they're in in order to be able to speak out, and does that, and to what extent? Um, are they, do they need to sort of play to the culture of that environment, which in itself has been traditionally male, male dominated? So it's a deep question. Um, and I, I'm conscious that we're getting to close to the end of time. Um, but, uh, Mitra or Uma, if you've uh, got some observations, I think it'd be great. Yeah. To yeah. Um, so, so I would say this for the young female professionals that I, I think, Claire, you were going to ask me the question at the end. Um, I'd say there's four things for you to do. Um, you know, when you work in a corporate. Um, the first is uh, to ask. You know, I negotiated my first salary because I wanted to sleep in my own bed. I had no strategy whatsoever. I just wanted more money so I could sleep in my own bed and get my own room. And for the rest of my career, I just asked because he said yes. Um, because, you know, and, and that's my, my, my biggest lesson on asking you shall most likely receive. So give the opportunity to the other party to say yes to you. And if it's no, doesn't matter, at least you ask. The second is to plan. You know, I, I hear so many women come to lead in events and they want, need a mentor, for example. That requires planning. You know, you gotta do your homework. You gotta understand where you wanna go, what help you need, et cetera. And the third is for young female professionals, because I made this mistake, you know, sitting behind your desk and expecting people to know all the great work that you're doing doesn't work. You have to promote yourself. Um, that is really uncomfortable for introverts like myself, but people are not going to know what you do until you tell them and, and promote kind of the work that you do. And last is probably the most powerful thing I'm, I'm really passionate about for Lean In. It's the concept of circles where women come together to help each other. Um, and, you know, this is not having a circle of friends. This is having a Lean In circle that's going to give you the advice straight up, often tough advice. And it's really good for your own personal development. My own circle has managed to negotiate salaries and uh, get in higher positions. We have more than 100 circles in Lean In. And actually, we launched Lean In in Standard Chartered Bank. And we have over 100 Lean In circles in Standard Chartered Bank. So, um, you know, come and support each other. And if you're a young female uh, professional, go and mentor a student because we all need to do more to help. Thank you. Mitra, have you got any uh, one last calls to action? Very well said, summarized, Uma, thank you. But just one thing, just stay true to yourself and, and recognize your voice. Each one of us have a voice. If you stay authentic to your voice, I think everything sorts itself out. That's my little mm -hmm. advice. Leave you with. Thank you. Thank you. John, welcome back. Um, I'm so sorry that uh, we didn't unfortunately get to hear Siuchui's um, stories of uh, particularly some of the initiatives she's been leading, which has been great. Um, yes, um, that, that's that's unfortunate, but certainly it's been a great discussion. Um, thank you, Claire, for for moderating the, the discussion with with Mitra and Uma, and and also Siuchui at, at the start. Um, it's uh, I think there are there are lessons there for men and women developing their career and also developing a um an inclusive environment uh, which we should all be uh trying to do every every chance we get so thank you thank you very much uh, and thank you very much uh, uma and mitra both and john um for a fantastic engaging session um and uh have a great conference everyone else thank you john for the opportunity thank you, thank you. bye